is most usefully treated as a supremest example, Milton's exposition of musica speculativa. Bless pair of sirens, pledges of heaven's joy, spear-like, harmonious sisters, voice and verse. Wed your divine sounds and mix power employ, dead things with inbreathed sense, able to pierce, and to our high raised fantasy present that undisturbed song of pure consent. Ah, sung before the sapphire colored throne, to him that sits thereon with saints shout and solemn jubilee, where the bright seraphim in burning row there. Loud, uplifted angel trumpets blow, and the seraphic host in the thousand choirs touch their immortal harps of golden wires. And with those just spirits that wear victorious psalms, hymns devote and holy psalms, singing everlastingly that we on earth with undiscording voice may rightly answer that melodious noise as once we did till disproportioned sin jarred against nature's chime and with harsh din broke the fair music that all creatures made to the great lord whose love their motion swayed in perfect diapason who whilst they stood in first obedience their state of good or may we soon again Renew that song and keep in tune with heaven till God ere long to his celestial consort does unite to live with them and sing an endless more endless morn of light. Uh -huh. Wouldn't that be nice if we could go back and listen to harmony and live in the morn of endless light? Uh -huh. We're doing analysis of Adesal music is mostly usually treated as the supremest example of Milton's exposition of musica uh, speculativa. We're reading from uh, the untuning of the sky. Um, in the following discussion, we shall attempt to read in it in the context of 17th century attitude towards sacred music and also as a meditative poem involving the musical imagery of psychic tonus. Adesala musica is certainly a meditation, but not having the set topic such as death required by Professor Marx's stricter use of the term, the circumstance providing, provoking the meditation is or purports to be an occasional one. The poem's movements subsequently by no means resembles the involved symbolic action of the more metaphysically oriented poem of religious contemplation. Nor does the imagery involve the use of emblematic devices, the whole poem occasionally bearing the impressamoto relationship to its title. Uh, as seems often to be the case with Herbert, instead the contemplation moves from the consideration of a concrete mundane event through a synthesized classical Christian account of the universal significance of that event to a final supplication based on that account. The whole argument of the poem preceding the final prayer is handled in a single 24-line sentence that the purely technical problem of sustaining this syntactic intensity through the mazes of independent causes and varied line lengths is brilliantly solved in the poem as been remarked before that the text appearing in the 1645 edition of milton's poems is the product of arduous rewriting is obvious from the changes in almost every line of the three successive drafts of the poem but many of the fundamental effects of these changes upon the poem's the final successful state seem to have been ignored consideration of these m and mandations generally lump the consolations and substitutions here with those at the end of Sweet Echo in Camus. In the words of a frequently co quoted critic, the corrections are designed to avoid the technical musical terms which are in the original readings, which I as technical might obscure to the general reader. But let us turn here to the text itself. Now we get to hear the poem again. 
Blessed pair of sirens, pledges of heaven's joy. Spearborn harmonious sisters, voice and verse, wed your divine sounds and mixed power employ dead things with inbreed the sense able to pierce and to our ra high raised fantasy present that undisturbed song of pure consent ah sung before the sapphire colored throne to him that sits thereon with saintly shout and solemn jubilee where the bright seraphim in burning row their loud uplifted angel trumpets blow and the cherubic host in thousand choirs touch their immortal harps of golden wires with those just spirits that wear victorious psalms saw hymns devote and holy psalms singing everlastingly that we on earth with undiscording voice may rightly answer that melodious noise as once we did till disportion sin jarred against nature's chime and with harsh din broke the fair music that all creatures made to the great lord whose love their motion swayed in perfect diapason whilst they stood in first obedience and their state of good oh may we soon again renew that song and keep in tune with heaven till god ere long to his celestial consort us unite to live with him and sing in endless morn of light uh -huh. wouldn't that be nice uh -huh. he's saying we could get back to the harmony of the spheres and the light uh -huh. yeah. starting almost at the very beginning we may notice how in the successive versions of line three, there is a movement from abstraction to misplaced concrete musical imagery and then to a baser balance between the two. First reading is, fine power and joint force employ. The second mix or chord, choice chords and happiest sounds employ. And the third and the final version corrects the grotesque application to the words of strings, chords, as well as reading vertical harmonic clusters the former being the more conventional, the older meaning usually employed in musical the imagery in the 16th, 17th centuries. The redundancy of power and force is also removed. But the identity of voice and verse preserved long enough for them to be wed rather than merely blurred is of considerable importance. The sisterhood of music and poetry. <laughs> They're like sisters. <laughs> Do you think music and poetry could be like sisters? Uh -huh. Is a theme that we have observed here, and whether we are are to read sphere born in the second line as carried unto the spheres, and like the lady's echo, daughter of the sphere. Uh -huh. The purely pagan cosmological complement can be seen to be a conventional one, but from the very beginning, the Christian theme of the Im intimation of the heavenly music as seen in actual earthly singing appears in pledges of heaven's joy and it is obvious that the invocation of the union of music and poetry will be made to signify more than merely a dual compliment as in barnfield's sonnet to spencer and dow and in which music and poetry are sisters and brothers <laughs> You think they could be brothers and sisters? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It is just this union of voice and verse. Uh -huh. They just call it voice and verse, heralded at the beginning of the poem, which some studies tend to lose sight of. Uh, perhaps the most significant emendation for the study of the poem's strategy, however, might be said to consist uh, of removal after line four and the second draft of the fourth lines that would have tended to hasten the conclusion of the poem and somewhat to trivialize import after the reference to the penetrating power of the words music before the 
before the mansion of the air state of mind, the two sisters, sirens, continued to be addressed. And whilst your equal raptures, tempered sweet, and high mysterious holy spousal meet, snatch us from earth a while, and us of ourselves and homebred woes beguile. <laughs> In the first place, these lines continue the personification of music and poetry and reinforce the metaphor of wedding with a, an almost erotic image, the tempered sweet of tuning, coming under an interpretation of some mystical quasi-sexual aura that Milton wanted to reserve the traditional figure of temperament and tuning for a later expansion seems obvious, and in that the later section will avoid the use even of the conventional sweet in favor of the more usual fair because of the former words frequent erotic as a or at least amorous use seems to suggest something of what might have contributed to these lines unsuitability but it was probably the premature application not a prayer to god but a, a to a the semi-deified mu Christian muses that rang most vaults and the snatches from earth after the serious consideration and fussing wholly replaced by happy knave native for home bread had to go because of the almost hyperbolic quality of the image which one contrasted with the more staid but more deeply believed prayer at the end in which the wish is expressed that the human ear meditators may some day be brought in tune with heaven. Mm -hmm. I wish we could be tuned up. I think we could listen to the music of the spheres. The platonic sirens who produce the actual sphere sounds are invoked here. Mm -hmm. Platonic. Uh, should we invoke Plato's actual sphere sounds and be brought in tune with heaven? Hmm. Wow. We are reading John Milton within the book, The Untuning of the Sky, Ideas of Music in English Poetry by John Hollander. Jenny, what do you think? Yeah, he's got good stuff. It's very heavy. Milton is very, uh, <laughs> he's a heavyweight. <laughs> yeah. In some ways, he's heavier than Shakespeare. <laughs> we are reading at a solemn music with analysis. <laughs> it's solemnly read. I'm solemnly. Do you think I read it solemnly? Uh, I thought he came after Shakespeare. Yeah, he wrote a poem on Shakespeare. We're reading The Untuning of the Sky, Ideas in the Music and English Poetry, particularly about the harmony of the spheres and the music of the spheres, which is obtained by and reconnected by something like Sarachap Yoga in the East, that is. Mm -hmm. 